I want to be clear from the outset. This sermon is not an endorsement of any political party, nor is it an indictment of any individual. My concern is solely for the state of your soul and where you stand before God. My concern is about where you are heading when you die. What you need to remember is that there is a real devil who hates you, who hates everything that is near and dear to you, a devil that will stop at nothing to destroy you. He is the accuser of the brethren, the serpent, that great deceiver of old, the adversary, the father of lies, the god of this world, the prince of the power of the air, Lucifer, the fallen one. As it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Today, I want to remind you that one of Satan's most insidious devices is the creation of idols. And in our current climate, politics has become one of the greatest idols of all. Throughout history, humanity has had a strange inclination to create idols. We see it time and time again in the Bible, whether it was the golden calf in the wilderness, the high places of Baal, or the Asherah poles scattered across Israel. The Israelites, though chosen by God, constantly struggled with the temptation to elevate something or someone above the Almighty. The devil knows that human beings have a proclivity to create idols, and he exploits this weakness to divert our hearts from God. In today's world, we may not worship stone statues or wooden poles, but idolatry is still very much alive. It has taken new forms, wealth, fame, technology, and yes, politics. In an election year, the air is thick with anticipation, anxiety, and division. People are passionately declaring their allegiance to one candidate or another, often with the belief that this individual is America's last hope. But let me say this with love and kindness. No man or woman, no political party is America's last hope. Jesus Christ is our only hope, now and forevermore. Recently, I watched a video where a man went out on the street to interview people about who they were voting for. The responses were almost evenly split, about 50% Democrat and 50% Republican. But what struck me the most was that people from both sides of the political spectrum said something along the lines of, I am voting for this person because they are America's last hope. Let me say this with love and kindness. Do not let an individual or a political party be your last hope. No man, woman, or political party can bear the weight of your ultimate hope. That kind of hope belongs to God alone. In modern American politics, a troubling trend has emerged. Political figures are increasingly elevated to almost divine status by their most fervent supporters. This phenomenon is starkly illustrated in the cases of Donald Trump and Kamala Harris, who are sometimes described in terms that no human being, man or woman, should ever be subjected to. Some supporters of Trump go so far as to refer to him as a messiah figure, attributing to him powers and qualities far beyond those of any ordinary political leader. Similarly, some of Harris's admirers cast her as the future savior. I'm convinced that the ultimate solution to America's problems is not found in the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, or any other political entity. The solution is found in the kingdom of God. America is at its greatest when it follows Jesus Christ, and it quickly becomes lost when it departs from him. Why do we depart from Jesus Christ? It is because we as a nation have allowed ourselves to be swayed by the devices of Satan. In the book of Deuteronomy, we read about the death of Moses, the great leader of Israel. Moses was a man chosen by God, a prophet through whom God performed miracles and delivered his law. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 1 to 8. Then Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah, across from Jericho. There the Lord showed him the whole land, from Gilead to Dan, all of Naphtali, the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev and the whole region from the valley of Jericho, the city of Palms, as far as Zoar. Then the Lord said to him, this is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. 
He buried him in Moab in the valley opposite Beth Peor, but to this day no one knows where his grave is. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak nor his strength gone. Have you heard one of the theories as to why, when Moses died, God himself buried him in an undisclosed location? This theory that I personally believe states that because God knew that the Israelites, in their reverence for Moses, might have been tempted to turn his grave into a shrine to worship the man rather than the God who empowered him. In Jude 9, we even learn that Michael the archangel had to contend with Satan over the body of Moses, emphasizing how real the threat of idolatry was. Jude chapter 1 verse 9. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. If the Israelites, who witnessed God's miracles firsthand, could be tempted to turn a man into an idol, how much more could we, who live in a world of constant distraction and deception, fall into the same trap? I am not saying that any of the current presidential candidates are of the stature of Moses. They are not. But I use this example to illustrate how human beings can elevate leaders to heights that no man or woman should occupy. When we begin to see political leaders as our last hope, we are treading on dangerous ground. The Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things, Jeremiah 17-9. When we invest our hope in human beings, we are setting ourselves up for disappointment and, more importantly, we are turning our backs on the only one who can truly save us. Consider the words of Psalm chapter 146, verses 3 to 4. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth, in that very day his plans perish. Brothers and sisters, no matter how charismatic, how strong, or how well-intentioned a political leader may be, they are still just a person. They are fallible, mortal, and subject to the same weaknesses as any of us. Their plans are temporary, but God's plans are eternal. The events we witness unfolding in our world today are indeed temporary, mere moments in the vast timeline of human history. However, God's plan is eternal, rooted in a divine purpose that transcends time and space. For He is an eternal God, unchanging and everlasting, whose wisdom and sovereignty extend far beyond the fleeting concerns of our earthly lives. It is crucial to remember that God is not bound by human institutions or political affiliations. He is not a Democrat, nor is he a Republican. He is the Ancient of Days, a title that signifies his timeless nature and infinite wisdom. As the Ancient of Days, God knows what tomorrow holds, for he sees all things from a distance, beyond the constraints of our limited understanding. He is the omnipresent God, existing everywhere at all times, and he is omniscient possessing complete and perfect knowledge of all things. In times of uncertainty, particularly during the lead-up to elections, many people experience fear and anxiety about the future. They worry about what might happen if the candidate they support does not win. They fear the potential collapse of the economy, the loss of their jobs, and the instability that could follow. But I want to remind you that even if the leader you voted for is not in office, you do not have to live in fear. The outcome of an election, while significant, is not the final determinant of your well-being or your future. What if the economy collapses? What if you lose your job? These are legitimate concerns, but they should not dominate your thoughts or drive you into a state of fear. Instead, I encourage you to place your trust in God, who remains sovereign regardless of who sits in the Oval Office. God's sovereignty means that He is in control of all things at all times, in all places. He will not leave you nor forsake you, no matter the circumstances. Consider the story of Elijah, who was fed by ravens during a time of great need. This story illustrates God's ability to provide in ways that are beyond our comprehension. Just as he provided for Elijah in the wilderness, God has resources and means to sustain you that you may know nothing about. His provision is not limited to what we can see or understand. It comes from his infinite power and love. Therefore, do not place your ultimate hope in political leaders, economic stability, or worldly security. These things are temporary and subject to change. Instead, put your hope in Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Christ is the solid rock on which you can stand, 
the firm foundation that will not be shaken by the storms of life. In him you will find peace that surpasses all understanding, even in the midst of uncertainty and fear. We must remember that Satan is the prince of this world, and he delights in using the things of this world to draw us away from God. Politics, with its power struggles, its allure of control, and its promises of utopia, is one of the devil's most effective tools. He uses it to stir up fear, anger, and division among us, to distract us from our true purpose, which is to serve and glorify God. Regardless of what happens in this election, regardless of who sits in the Oval Office, let your faith be in Christ, not in a man or woman. Presidents will come and go, laws will be passed and repealed, nations will rise and fall, but Jesus Christ remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our allegiance must be to him alone. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul reminds us, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are citizens of a heavenly kingdom, and our King is on the throne ruling with justice, mercy, and love. No election can change that. No political power can dethrone him. And no earthly ruler can offer us the salvation that he freely gives. We are not ignorant of Satan's devices, and one of his most effective devices is idolatry. He knows that if he can get us to fix our eyes on anything other than Jesus, he has succeeded in leading us astray. Do not let politics become your God. Do not let the rhetoric of this world drown out the voice of the Holy Spirit. Do not let your hope rest in the hands of those who cannot save. A call to return to Christ. As we navigate these tumultuous times, I urge you to return to your first love, Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 to 5, the Lord admonishes the church at Ephesus. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. America has a rich Christian heritage, but we have drifted far from it. We have allowed the pursuit of power, wealth, and influence to overshadow our pursuit of God. It is time to repent, to turn away from the idols we have created, and to seek the face of the Lord. This is not just a message for the nation as a whole. It is a message for each of us individually. We must examine our own hearts and ask ourselves, have I made an idol out of politics? Have I placed my hope in a party or a candidate instead of in Christ? If the answer is yes, then now is the time to repent. Now is the time to lay down those idols and to recommit ourselves to following Jesus with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Only then can we hope to see true change, not just in our nation, but in our own lives. In closing, I want to reiterate that this message is not about politics. It is about where we place our trust and our hope. As 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 warns us, we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. We know that he will use whatever means he can to lead us away from God, and in this season, he is using politics to do just that. But we do not have to fall into his trap. We can choose to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. We can choose to place our hope in the unshakable kingdom of God rather than in the shifting sands of earthly politics. And we can choose to be a light in the darkness, pointing others to the true hope that is found only in Christ. America's last chance is not found in an election, but in a return to the God who made us. Let us not be distracted by the noise of this world, but instead let us listen for the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, calling us back to himself. Let us pray for our nation, for our leaders, and for ourselves. A hundred years from now, whether you were a Democrat or a Republican will be of no significance to you. What will truly matter is your relationship with Jesus Christ. God is not confined to any political party, Republican, Democrat, or Independent. He transcends our human-made boxes and limitations. His love, grace, and sovereignty are not bound by our political affiliations or worldly systems. Yet in today's world, many people have begun to elevate politics and political figures to a place that is dangerously close to idolatry. It's as if political allegiance has become a form of worship, 
and people are looking to politicians and parties for the salvation, security, and guidance that only God can truly provide. This misplaced loyalty manifests when we start believing that a particular political party or candidate can solve all of our problems or act as the savior of our nation. We place our hope in them, defend them with fervor, and align our identities with them to the point that it consumes us. Some even go as far as allowing political ideologies to dictate their values, priorities, and relationships, forgetting that as Christians, our ultimate allegiance is to Christ alone. When we do this, we are at risk of turning our political affiliations into idols, placing them above God in our hearts and minds. The danger lies in the fact that political parties are made by humans, and thus, they are flawed. No political leader or party is perfect, and none can fully embody the righteousness, justice, and mercy of God. Politics is inherently tied to the imperfect systems of this world, which are tainted by sin and human ambition. When we put our faith in these systems, or in political figures as if they hold the key to our salvation, we forget that only God is sovereign. His kingdom is not of this world, and his purposes transcend our political divides. In Revelation 3, verses 20, it is written, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. This is the heart of the gospel. Jesus came and died to give us salvation and an eternal relationship with him. His sacrifice offers us more than just forgiveness. It offers us a lifelong companionship, a promise that he will be with us in this life and for all eternity. When eternity comes, you will not be remembered for your political beliefs. What will define you is your relationship with Jesus Christ. He is with you now through every trial and joy, and he will continue to be with you forever. I often find myself pondering heaven, and the more I meditate on it, the more I realize how detached we should be from this fleeting world. This world is temporary, and the labels and identities we cling to are equally fleeting. Yes, you have the freedom to vote for whichever party you choose, but let me urge you, do not allow politics or any earthly allegiance to become an idol in your life. Always keep heaven in your heart and mind. Oh, how I love heaven. In Revelation 21, verses 1 to 4, the word paints a glorious picture of what awaits us. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Notice how the phrase with them is repeated three times in verse 3. This repetition emphasizes the profound truth that eternity will be spent in the presence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Eternity, my friends, is not just a destination. It is an existence with our God. Heaven is where our souls long to be because heaven is where God is. So I ask you today, where is your soul headed when you die? Heaven, that glorious place filled with the atmosphere of God's presence, awaits those who trust in Christ. Heaven is not just a place, it is being forever with our God. Fix your eyes on this eternal reality, for this world is fading away, but the kingdom of God endures forever.